Weedy is joining just now. Should be on in a sec. And there he is. Hey, Weedy. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Cliff, how you doing, brother? I'm I'm very well. Good to meet you. We met really briefly in LA, I guess. In LA now. Yeah, good to see you. Um, Same here. I remember. I, I remember. I remember. I remember. Nice. Well, we are live, so we can we can we can just jump right in. Um, let me introduce you. Um, so, uh, people who play percussion most likely do know Weedy. If you don't know Weedy, uh, Weedy is originally from Ghana, uh, and at a young age moved to St. Louis. And East St. Louis. East St. Louis. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and uh, Weedy has. Uh, well, I saw I saw Weedy. I saw you for the first time uh, playing with Jonathan Scales. Oh, okay, okay. At at, at, uh, at the photo gallery. Um, what's his name? Uh, In Nashville. Yeah, my man. Uh, 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 um, I mean, he does the instrument heads. I'm trying. I'm the instrument. Uh, uh, uh. Oh my God! It's, I, I just had a brain. Just my yeah, brain, and I just spoke to him the other day. Lord have mercy. It, it'll it'll come. We'll, we'll, it's we'll... going. I just had a. Oh God! I just had. I'm and I just said his name all the time. God, don't let nobody know that. Oh, no, nobody will know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and so uh, Weedy has has played with a lot of great players, including Jonathan Scales, and um, we'll talk about a lot of different people he's played with but also has studied with with some of the great Jimbe Folas as well as others and we'll also talk about your background and yeah and and, and you know how how you you were influenced and um who you learned from but I know we mm -hmm. share we share some teachers uh so I'm curious also about um about your you know when you first studied with them and that sort of thing uh um, okay yeah so I was just curious you, so you moved from from Ghana to East St. Louis. All right. at a here's really story. Young... So here's the story. Okay. My mother and my father met in East St. Louis, right? Uh -huh. My father was working at um, the U of I, and he came down to East St. Louis at a time. What's um, the U of I? The University of Illinois. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, can you guys see me? I know it's kind of. Yeah, I think if you're not if you're not in the window, we can see you better there. Yeah, yeah, that's like better. this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. That's okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, actually, I'll do this because I'm at, I'm recording. I'm finishing a project of mine, and I'm at the studio as we speak. So, okay. I move around. Is this good? It's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Basically, my mother and my father met. In East St. Louis, my mother's a, a phenomenal jazz drummer, funk drummer. Father is a Ghanaian composer, phenomenal composer, arranger, drummer himself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can honestly say I'm here because of the music. You know, there was love, but the music is, the drum is, I'm here because of the drum. How did they, um, how did they meet exactly? They met, uh, <laughs> it's funny, they met because of a, a, a mutual friend. Uh -huh. So my mother was, funny story, my mother was playing drums with a legendary musician for like a couple of weeks. You probably heard of him. His name is James Brown. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's playing with James wait, wait, Brown. Was she the like, only female drummer to ever play with him? I'm, I wonder. Exactly. Uh -huh. his, his a lot of people don't talk about that. Uh -huh. So um, so for like, um, what's a... Um, for like a month before my grandfather got sick, who was a jazz drum as well, mm -hmm. um, before he, she found out he wasn't doing so good and he was about to pass away soon, she came back to East St. Louis. At that time, she came back and when my grandfather had passed, on Christmas day, she was devastated, let alone she didn't want to play no more. Mm -hmm. So a year and some change goes by and she gets a call from this high school in East St. Louis, which is a legendary jazz high school called the Lincoln Jazz, Lincoln Jazz High School, jazz okay. band, right? Uh -huh. Under the direction of the great Ronald Carter, a friend of our of hers named uh uh um who was, who was this Taylor? Uh who told her? I forgot. Make a long story short, she says to him, 
says, you know, said, we need somebody to work with the drummers with these pieces because we got this African man coming in and his stuff is next level. Well, so we need somebody to break down how to play this stuff to them. Uh -huh. so, no. All right. Make a long story short. She comes there late and my mother, my father's a proud Ghanaian man. He said, okay, you will write this, you will read this, you will read this, you will read this, you will do this, you will do this. So they all playing the music and the drummers couldn't get it. So this woman walks in and they was like, well, where's the, the drum instructor to help me with this? Where's he? Where's he? And they never said it was the she instead of a he. Mm -hmm. So when she walks through, they was like, there she goes. Her name was Vera Bowden. Okay. Vera said, he goes, woman, the amazement of his his face when he was a she was able to one read two to play the phrases that he was trying to teach the drummers it was basically pan logo on drum set uh -huh. basically pan logo on drum set okay. and that was in the early 80s because uh -huh. i was born in 82. okay so from that day he saw this and he was trying to keep giving the hell like okay if she can do this she can't do this she can't do that she can't do that and everything she would he would present to her she would catch it she would uh -huh. catch it and then add her old stuff her own flair that old New Orleans stuff she learned from her father. Uh -huh. So all of that, along with the African stuff, it all became full circle. So they became connected, not because of just love, but the love of the music, of the drums. Yeah. So then that's what happened. She okay. goes, she, she ends up getting pregnant as musicians doing their thing, goes to a crowd, stays, boom, boom, and brings me back, okay. and brings me back. Later. So after and she got pregnant, she went. She went and moved to. Uh, yeah, she went exactly. And uh -huh. then from there, she comes back to the home of where it all started, East St. Louis. Uh -huh. And I think for and then after that, we went to Champagne and, and worked. My, and my father and my mother, of course, separation happened. But uh -huh. then something happened a couple of years later. She goes to Champagne and they uh, unite around five. And my father had a band called Bantuku. Bantuku at this time was a powerhouse. This is when their first quote unquote, this was the Afro beat band. I call them, I call my dad's band in the eighties, <laughs> the first, the, the African, uh, the, the folkloric African snarky puppy or the or, or <laughs> folkloric African uh, return to forever or uh, the African Mahavishnu Walker. Cause he was writing crazy stuff along this time with drums and and the, the pieces were so out there that, that people wouldn't believe that this man was able to write like that. So, uh, so, so just to stop you for a second. I'm just curious about, uh, so what was he, where was he from in Ghana and how, where was it, what was his background to be able to write and that sort of okay, thing? Okay, great question. He's Accra, but he's from an area called uh, Takwa Abuntiaku. Okay. Takwa Abuntiaku, because he's a Fanti and uh, his wife is from where the north. Where in is that? Huh? I, I Near Takurati. Say again? Near Takurati. But he came down, when he came from Takarati to Accra, he was from an area, Bokum. Okay. And Bokum was where the boxers live in Accra. Okay. I, I stayed in Osu, Osu um, when you I was- You Osu, okay, of course, I know exactly. He was in the nice area. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, all the guys are nice, but that, yeah. that's, the, that's the lavish area where people go have their KFC and they, you know- Not, not where I stayed, but- <laughs> uh, Okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, um, so, when she, uh, when they started this band, it was a powerhouse because my mother was playing drums with the band. Uh -huh. It was a powerhouse. I mean, he had five horns, bass, two guitars, keys, four drummers, four percussionists. Yeah. But three at that time, it was four, including me. It was my father, myself, Scott Mordecai, and Steve Balderson. Uh -huh. Those were the drummers, the, the hand, the hand drummers that played all this inside the band, along with my mother. It was a powerhouse band. So, but one thing happened around six, seven, nine. I get playing all these rhythms, folkloric rhythms, whether it was gahun, bawa, gahun bawa chepeko. Uh, what else we used to play? Uh, Agbaja and all the other stuff. Uh -huh. Takai, because he used to play a lot of Brekete, Luna drums, and songs with the uh, songs as well. But something very unique happened. At that time, once again, my mother and my father separated. But something really important happened. I came back to East St. Louis, and, and my mother wanted me to continuously play 
folkloric music because by that time, uh, you know, my mother, my father broke up. Uh-huh. But she, the music needed to keep going. So she called a man and this man was a friend of hers from when she was first working with James Brown because it was uh-huh. this guy who I'm about to name introduced her to James Brown and set it up for her and James Brown. His name was Mortachon. Okay. Mortachon was a, one of the pioneers of djembe drumming in America. There was two guys from West Africa to make djembe drumming very famous. One, Laji Kamra, second, Mortachon. Okay. And Mortachon <laughs> was still in East St. Louis working with Catherine Dunham. And the relationship between my, my father and Mortachon was very close because it was the time where my father brought him to work with Catherine Dunham as well to work with the jazz high school I was talking about earlier it was uh-huh. because of him. Okay. Now, more child heard from my mother. He said, oh, yeah, a long time. She says, well, I'm about to leave. I'm moving to Miami with my family. We're going to Miami. I think that's before they went to Miami and then New Jersey and then back to Atlanta, something like that. So <laughs> he, go, he says, well, if he's going to play, there's one guy here that I know he can work. He works with children. His name is Sylvester Sunshine Lee. Hmm. And that man gave me the key to the universe. Now, of course, I'm a Ghanaian proud, play Ghanaian music. That's my heart. That's my father's lineage. I love it. Mm-hmm. But this man, I'm telling you, is the one that opened up the door to my life. Sylvester Sunshine Lee. I can never, ever take anything away from that man because he gave me the key to the universe. It had not been for that man and what he did for me, nobody would know who Weedy is. And, and so- Talk, talk more about what he did for you. Sunshine was the one who told, gave me and let me see what a djembe was. Uh huh. So he was, he was, he was a student of, of. He was a student of Mortchamp and Catherine Dunham. Okay. But, but at the same time, he, um, he had a group in East St. Louis called the East St. Louis Performance Ensemble. Uh huh. It was an all children's group as well as adult group, but this group it was a children's group that showed and focused on the beauty and the tradition of West African culture through music, song, and dance. But he would work, he was working with different artists who were at that time in the 80s, it was a lot of Senegalese artists. So we would work with artists such as Katapsi Soko, Raymond Sila, Abdullah uh, Jabate, uh, Suleiman, uh, Suleiman Job, uh, who else was coming to? Ibrahim Makamara, Pagai, all these different artists were coming to East St. Louis because of uh, Catherine Dunham. Okay, and so through that, he also, he also worked with uh, with Sunshine and worked with, of course, Marchand brought those guys here, but they also worked with Sunshine's Dance Company because it was a bunch of children that he was bringing this tradition to. So it was cool to see a bunch of kids that was doing this folklore, you know what I'm saying? So, so- why come to... Hmm? Yeah, sorry. So as I was gonna say, so so at an early age, were you getting um, experience with those different artists that were? Yeah, out? but once again, don't forget, I'm still in my mind. I don't care what a djembe is, because in my mind, I'm care about achimenfu, pan logo drums, breketes, lunas. That was what I knew. That's what I knew. That was my life. Yeah. So I had these instruments in my house. So then I didn't put two and two together to bring. I brought those instruments, or at least the first day, I'll never forget, the first day I played with the class. My mother, which was a really slick thing she did, there was a, a, a corner store that I would go buy little chips and stuff, and he lived next to the corner store. So one day she drives, she said, I'm going to take a ride. So she takes a ride, and she takes me to the corner store. While taking me to the corner store, we passed Sunshine's house. And I see all of these drums outside. Mm-hmm. And now I'm losing my mind. How old Never are you? Seen... By this time, I'm I'm six or seven years old. Okay. Early, early, yeah. Late six, seven years old. So I'm going crazy. I'm like, woo, woo, as a kid. See, like I'm that was my candy. That was my toys. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. was my way of life. So I saw these drums and I was like, damn, this is it. So he says, she, she goes to him and says, Brother Sunshine, Brother Sunshine. Hey, ma'am, how you doing? Say hello. My name is Ann Morris. This is my son, Weedy Bramer. And he is a drummer. You know, his father's a Ghanaian drummer. I'm a drummer. His grandfather's a drummer. His father's father's a drummer. She says, well, he said, you know what? He said, Miss Ann, it looks like he can play. You want to bring him down? So we have classes every Monday and Wednesday at the um, 
at the uh, neighborhood house, hmm. Leslie Bates neighborhood house. I'll never get that place in the basement, right by the library. It was kind of cool. And she said, what time is class? Tomorrow from six to eight, he'll be there. So I didn't bring my, uh, and pinch of mine. I didn't take my fun logo. I didn't take none of the folk logo. So I took a conga and I took the conga and I played the technique of sticking hand to the class. Now, mind you, that's a lost art if you don't study Haitian drummers or nothing like that. So in my mind, that's the world. I didn't use hands unless I played Fan Logo, but that wasn't my thing. The sticking hands technique was my thing. Mm -hmm. So I go into class and he's there, the kids are there, and I'm, you know, nervous, but I could actually play. I wasn't like one of the kids that they could tink it, tink it. So it tripped him up that I was playing all this intricate stuff at this age. And the other musicians I'll never get, it was a, one of my dearest, one of my big brothers and mentors is Babatunde Sila, Bully Babatunde Sila. He saw me, he said, this kid got it. He got something. He he was saying something, he's like, my mama, she was so headstrong. She was like, this kid, he gonna do some stuff. But as a kid, you don't trip off no stuff like that. But my mom was, used to, I was always like, this kid got it. So I would watch them play that first class. And I was checking out these drums. I was like, Dang, okay, and I'm doing all these rips that I heard my father play. Mm-hmm. And all this stuff inside of the music. And the musician was like, it was like jazz to, it was like, oh, wait a minute. He's not gonna play on the one because that was where my mind was. So another year goes by, I'm still playing with, now I'm in the group, but I'm playing stick in hand, right? Stick in hand. So by the time 89, 90. Okay, so so just just the, uh, one thing about that. So were you, um, when you're playing stick in hand, so they were just letting you go. So were you just playing whatever you, you heard? It was three things. I was starting to understand the mentality of what the music they were playing. But in my mind, it was Ghanaian music all the way. And I was implementing Ghanaian music inside of the styles and rhythms they were playing, which at that time, it was the Senegalese technique they were learning from. Mm-hmm. So even though I was playing some Ghanaian stuff that in my mind, this is the right way. Y'all don't know what the hell y'all talking about. It was still, a, a, it was a formulation of understanding folklore. Mm-hmm. They had the way they learned folklore from the way I was learning songs, whether it was not knowing I'm playing stick in hand and actually, actually the one of the first rhythm we were playing was a, a Kong Kong and Linjin. And I learned that on playing stick in hand and the guy, one of my big, my big brothers, I was telling you about, he was like, you actually understand the language. You just don't realize it. Because years later, I found out the Kutiro is the drum that accompanies that dance, which is a stick in hand drum. Oh, interesting. I didn't put all that together at that point. But they, see, they saw out things before I could play. So a year go by, I would this only thing I would do was listen to music, continues buying albums, buying cassettes, compiling albums, buying cassettes, and reading the liner notes from the cassettes. And I would just start to hearing all these instruments of a djembe. Mm-hmm. Now I'm watching my teacher, I'm watching my master play Sunshine, but I never played the instrument. I never touched it. I would just watch him. I would watch the dunu, and at that time, the junjun, because that's what I was taught. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was watching but then I would watch the technique of that and play those rhythms with the stick in hand. Now I'm learning the conversation with the dunu and I'm watching the djembe. But one day I used to always, I, I was always like to imitate my teachers. So I asked Sunshine, I said, Sunshine, Sunshine, can, 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 can I play your drum? He looked at me, he grabbed my head. He said, go ahead. They call me a certain name. If you ever call me this name, I know people know me. And he say, Lord, they, how they know me? Weedy man. Go ahead, Weedy man. You got it. Go ahead, Weedy man. So I saw his djembe and I used to always like playing it. He had a unique shaped djembe. It was, to this day, I've never seen a djembe like this. And I would, he used to call it the cannon. And I would hit it and I would look around, see if anybody coming, and I would imitate him. And to the point where I, would doing what I, I was doing what I was doing with my father, with Ghanaian drum, but now I'm doing it with my other master, my teacher, mm-hmm. Sunshine. So I'm watching him. And so I remember 
one of the dancers says, oh, we got late, we coming late. Brother Sunshine in there playing already. And then one of the, the, the parents is saying, that's the Brother Sunshine, she smiles. Hey, Brother Sunshine. Yes, it is, listen, listen. And the kids was like, listen to his hands. We could hear it, like listen to the slap. Now these kids talking about that, and talking about technique in the early, late 80s, early 90s, about a young boy. So and that was the that was the so I'm playing, I'm playing, and I stopped playing, and I just felt eyes on my back, and I turned around and I heard people snickering. And sunshine, I was like, all this time, huh? <laughs> I said, and I was so nervous, I started crying. They said, why are you crying? I don't even know to the day why I started crying. And I said, I don't know. He says, all this time. Because I remember I said, I said, I don't know. I don't want you to think I'm making fun of you. He says, the greatest thing you could do is tell your teacher, is imitate your teacher. That means you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. I will never forget that to this day. And I said, you're not mad at me? He said, am I mad? You playing the rest of the class. I said, no, no, no. He said, uh-uh, you playing. So then in my mind, I immediately imitated him without acting like him. I would, he was looking at my hand. I would start curving my hand where my technique used to be like this. Uh -huh. And the slap was cutting. And he was like, man. So he said, all right, all right. So from that day, he says, I will always bring my kunga. He said, no, we man play. So he bring a certain instrument, an extra djembe. So one day, I'll never forget it. One day, he says, Miss Ann, that's my mother, follow me in my house. I got, I got, I got to give Weedy something. So I'm in the car, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, he gonna give me a djembe. And my mama says, she already knew he was. Mm -hmm. So I go to the house and he had like 30 of these djembe's he brought back from synagogue. And he says, choose. I'm like, and how old are you? So not crazy. So I picked this one djembe, a little small djembe, right? Long leg. Uh -huh. Long leg. The, the bowl was short. It was a long leg. I'm like, oh my God, that one? He said, all right, now, Weedy. Weedy, man, you, you sure you, you can handle that? I'm like, yeah. So I brought it home. Every day I played this djembe. But now I'm playing to the albums I'm listening to and reading about. Well, this music, this music come from from Molly. It's, and I'm reading all the liner notes. I'm reading the names of the people, but I'm not putting two and two together. I'm, I'm really not. But I'm reading the names because it was like my it's my form of education. You know what I'm saying? At school for me, this was like I would go to school on my break. I would take out the, the envelope of the the liner notes and have it in my little folder and read it on my lunch. And that brought me joy. I could just stare at the photo. And my brain could be there with that photo, whether I knew this person or not. Mm -hmm. So years go by, about another two years go by, I'm like 10 or 11. And my mother got me a, a real, the real deal, Jimbe. The Jimbe was still this day, it was funny. I'm about this tall, the Jimbe was bigger than me. <laughs> but it was, and all my the cats, the older cats was like, man, that Miss Ann hooked you up. And I'm like, it's too big. <laughs> Do you have either of those drums still? I still have them. They still in the archive. The guy I'm telling you about, he has it. <laughs> he has it. But it's something you but but the second thing in my life that changed my djembe, what made me understand what djembe was, this was the breaking point. I was uh I was 10. I was 10 at this time. I'm 10 years old. I'm playing. But something happened where it went like this. <laughs> There was a documentary that came on TBS on one Saturday morning. Saturday morning, me and my mother, you know, we practiced together, you know. She played drums, I played my gym, baby, we practiced together. Mm -hmm. And right when the, uh, we got done practicing, I went on turn the television and National Geographic was coming on. And, uh, you know, and so that came on and then they was like, this next weekend on National Geographic, Master drummer from Guinea, West Africa, tries to use his djembe as a voice, as a tool to change the world. Mama Decatur, the king of the djembe, the djembe form, I'm like, oh my, it was like God had said, 
here you go. Hmm. Here you go. And my eyes, to this day, I still get goosebumps talking about it. Because hmm. it was like, it changed my life. Yeah. A video, a, a documentary. So the whole week, I'm just like a kid, like a kid for Christmas when nothing. And how old are you at this point? This time I was 10. Okay. I had to be a nine, nine or 10. Between so nine or 10. For about, you Jim for about two, three years? Three, now, Jim straight. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, God. So, you know, and now- You, you me, hadn't heard of him. You just saw this documentary. Yeah. Or you I saw just saw, and so what happened was, it's so weird how it was happening. I just, just did like that. So the documentary came on and it's like, it's be here next week. So that following week, we waited a whole week. My mama was like, oh my God. So we forgot his name. So instead of saying Mama Decatur, we knew who Manu Dibango was. So we were calling him Mama Dibango, hmm. not Mama Decatur. Mm -hmm. Until the following week, we go on television. And we sit in the living room. It comes on. But da -da 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 and there it goes. He interviewed. He had this little blue indigo outfit on. He did interview it. And I will never forget when I saw this man play. I said, this, and excuse my language. I know I probably can't curse, but. You can curse. That's fine. Okay. I, I said, now I say this, but in my head, I was like, if I was an adult then and I said this, there's no fucking way that an instrument can sound like that. Yeah. The look, the sound, the speed. And my mother was a drummer, she says. And now she's watching the videos and she was impressed by another drummer that was on there. And she was more, honestly, more impressed by him than Mommy Decatur uh -huh. was fine. Because uh -huh. she so thought he was a jazz drummer. So what was it? What was this this documentary? It wasn't Jim Bay Fola. It was Jim Bay Fola. It was Jim Bay Fola. It was Jim Bay Fola. They okay. used some of Jim Bay Fola and put it in National Geographic. Uh, and what was it about Fama, do you think? Because he was in, you know, it was one scene in the movie. How did he? Exactly. What was it about? My, this is funny you said that because my mother was like, Fama is fast and clean, but Fama is fast and musical. I'll never get it. <laughs> and I was a kid. I'm like, nah, Mama, listen to this man. Come on, he's, ooh. And I'm like, oh my, I'm going crazy. She said, when you get older, you'll see. Now, this is a woman who doesn't know what djembe is, but knows what drums are. Yeah. You understand? Know there's a difference. Well, that's when I realized it, that when I tell the truth, my mother, now my dad, Sunshine, or my, they, they gave, it was my mother who gave, opened up the door for me. Had it not been for her, not just life, giving me life, the life of what it is to be a drummer. That's a different thing. Hmm. What it is, a woman, and that's fact. If you look at anything to understand what a true, the true cats is, they always had a woman show them the, the, the way. She's bae. You know? Hell, even Mommy Decatur. Yeah. My mother. But it was that documentary that changed my life. It changed my life. I had, it was that day I said, I'm dedicating my life. Not to this African drumming, not to this Ghanaian drumming, to this instrument. The and I'll never forget Every day, I practicing. That's when I was. Every day, I would just anything djembe. I had to find it. So I started just trying to go to Best Buy Music, Street Side Records. I would buy different albums, different books, and read the liner notes. And then on the liner notes, if you like more African music, look up Beat Magazine. I'm like, okay. So I would find the Beat Magazine, and then I found out about a pro a program, and I just and these people now are some of my close dear friends called Afro Pop Worldwide. Oh, I love that show. That's a great show, yeah. How that came about, it was like God opening the doors after the door after the door after the door. God was presenting himself like, okay, here you go, my son. So Mama Decatur was the one that was like, boing, let alone my family. So mm -hmm. then I started reading about Mama Decatur. I was like, wow. So now, so then I never had his albums now. This was just a video. I didn't know he had albums. So when I found out he had an album, by the time I heard he had an album, by this time I'm 12 years old. Uh -huh. But before that, before that, I'm buying all these cassettes. Some of these cassettes, people today have never even heard of. Hmm. I mean, um, Festival National, the, uh, Al, um, the National Festival of Algeria, hmm. Percussion Festival of Algeria in 1967. These are cassettes that are like legendary. Mm -hmm. And when you ask artists who those people are, 
that's Vamadu, that's Laji, that's um, legendary Jimmy Fuller from Mali, Francois, um, I forgot Francois' last name. All of these cats was on these recordings. So when you ask these guys, you know these guys, at this age, these cats was looking at me like, how the hell you know this stuff? Because I was asking questions from what I was reading in the liner notes. That's why a lot of information I have now is not just because I asked folks, I was reading at this time. I was getting F's in school, but I was reading this stuff. But you were researching your ass off and what you were, were caring, what you cared about. And, uh, and my mother would read those things to me at night before I go to sleep, like a bedtime story, you know what I'm saying? So now I'm seeing this mommy de Kata and I'm re I heard about the family dude and I'm like, oh my God. So now one day I was on, um, like, like I said, by this time I'm 11 years old, and um, me and my mother's riding home and a station on the radio comes on, 88.1, St. Louis Community Radio. Uh -huh. And on 88.1, this guy says, hello, I am Josh Colinaire and welcome to Afro Pop Worldwide. And I was like, Afro Pop Worldwide? Today, we are listening to the great musicians of Senegal, West Africa. We have the artist Baba Mal with Yolele. And I was like, oh my God, from Senegal? Boom. Immediately a week later, I go to Street Size Rack and I find this guy, Baba Mom, and this other guy used to do it. So I buy the cassettes. And my mother said the most profound thing to this day, and she passed away five, six years ago. And to this day, I tell any interview, I say this. This woman looked me in my eyes with the cassette in my head, with the little money from the little gig I did. She says, for every album and cassette you buy, I didn't say CD, I said album cassette. She said, for every album can set you by, you will play and become friends with or record with every person you meet. And as a child, you're like, this, she's just not talking this. Every album I've ever bought from Baba Mom, listen to Afro Pop Worldwide, watching Mommy the Kid, Los Muñequitos, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. I've worked, recorded, became students or close factors or traveled with these artists. And that's what happened. So after that happened, I bought all these CDs and I started listening to all these cassettes. And then one CD I bought was from a guy from Mali by the name of Abdul Dumbia. Mm -hmm. And Abdul is the one who did like this. You can play all this shit and you sound amazing. But let me shoot, let me give you the route. And Abdul was like, another father figure that did me like this. So he was in East St. Louis? He came to East St. No, Louis? Abdul came to St. Louis in 1996. Uh -huh. By that time, I'm 14. And I was, and by that time, I was 14, I'm playing. And it was three other people that was very, very involved in my, my growing as a young man. But prior to that, it was a gentleman besides Celeste Sunshine Lee, it was three people or four. One is a guy, a guy by the name of Thaddy Kennedy, who had a group in St. Louis called Ingoma. Another gentleman was a name by the name, a man by the name of Mike Nelson. Mm -hmm. Another gentleman is a, na a, a, a name by a guy named Mandum Benesse, who just passed away, rest in peace. And the last one was a, my Jimbe Sensei on the Sunshine Book that did me like this. His name is Ibrahim Sila, Fred Struthers. That dude was the one who really like molded me to be like, okay, yeah, you can play, you got it, but here's some little stuff. Cause he was like a Jedi for Jim Bay for me. Hmm. Um, and you know, of course there's other people that I, I have mentioned that were like changed my life. Meshach Silas who passed away, who was a musician, a Jim Bay Fuller musician. You know, Musa Traore, of course, who I love to death. But these, these people that I named, all the names I, I just named, were very, very, very integrated and in, in molding me to being who I am today. But the first person, and not because she gave me life, was my mama. Yeah. So a few, a few questions. Uh, so, well, I want to kind of come back to where we were. But, but do you remember living in Ghana when you were when you were a baby? I don't remember none of it. You do remember it. I don't. Oh, you don't? Okay. And so what, what is your favorite? At that time, certain things I remember, certain things I don't. But one thing I do remember is stage. What's that? Being on stage. Okay, so I was going to ask, what is your first musical memory? Oh, 
first musical memory I know for a fact is a spot called Nature's Table. Champaign, Illinois, Nature's Table, my dad's band. Nature's Table was no bigger than a live, uh, like a living room and a small little house and had over a hundred people in there. And the band was half of the audience because it was the big ass band. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, my father had, he produced three albums with being that band. One called Bantuku, the white album. Other one is called um, Sounds of Kilimanjaro. Um, another one is Bantuku, the high, Sounds of Kilimanjaro, AAA, Africa, America, Asia. Okay. This man did the music and helped write the music for the 88 Olympics. Uh huh. So, your, your dad did. Composer. But those names of these people that I'm, I, 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 I talked about, if it wasn't for none of them people, you wouldn't see me there today. Yeah. You and, know? And so, um, well, this is kind of a little bit of a random, land, random uh, thing, but I want to play some music for you and just get your impression about it. Really. Yeah. I see random. Do you have you heard this music before? Either from here or from St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, I'm in New Orleans. Okay, so I just wanted to play that because that's that's uh, Duke Ellington's East St. Louis Toodaloo. Uh, East uh, St. Louis. Okay. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> but but um, I want I wanted to play something else also that you um you're on um, let me pull this up. So your dad, so your dad, how did he, what was his background as far as, but besides the, the traditional folkloric music, how did he? He was a composer. Uh, he went to the University of Bremen. Um, University of Bremen in Germany. He uh -huh. also taught at University of Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. In the music, ethnomusicality in the music department. Uh -huh. He taught at U of I. His thing was, being able to compose music with a sought out new sound. It's basically, it's funny, it's, 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 it's the damn the same thing I'm doing now, you know? Uh-huh. You're, 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 you're taking music same from I'm doing now. Past and, but yeah. he, as far as writing, composition, I just pray I could be like him. So, so you do write as well? Yeah, I, like, you know, I'm working on my project as I speak, like I said, and it's very, it's, it's a lot of people won't think you know, I wrote it because it's a lot of arrangement. The arrangement is uh -huh. big, but that's, if you really want to know my story is that you'll know that composition is my heart. It's my heart. Jimmy is my, is me. But uh -huh. my heart of writing and being able to create what it is that this instrument can do with other instruments and with other styles of music is two different things, so. Yeah. Hey, so I want to play this. This is um. So I've had Jonathan Scales on the show, and I want to play this song that you're on. Um.
this was really this was really an interesting recording i oh yeah i wanted to hear about this so so, so how'd you record it so i recorded it here in new orleans uh <laughs> And I gotta give a shout out to a lot of my, the whole band is my close friends. So um, there's two basses on this song, two. Yeah, we got, we have someone who popped in. Yo. Jonathan Oh, Stewart. he didn't tell me that just a second ago when I was on the phone with him. Uh, yeah, I just talked to you like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that a second ago. You know, I'm good at surprises. <laughs> Thank yeah. You Hi, Jonathan. Hello there, sir. How are I you? I hope you have a good day. I'm having a good day. I've been listening to your interview. I'm learning all the stuff about you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And oh, then, well, it's and a then, lot of stuff. But and I hope and I, I hope that we can do this bye. again because 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 you're getting this, a lot of really good stuff about your history and and definitely I have a lot of questions, but I thought it'd be fun to have Jonathan on here. And so, Jonathan, we were just listening to your song, The Trap. And it's, the, it's a story behind that, though. Please tell it. The story behind The Trap? Oh, yeah. yeah with me and you. you. So, 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 Rose, um, uh, I was talking to a guy by the name of Roosevelt Collier. And when I was on the phone with Roosevelt, Jonathan calls me. I said, Roosevelt, I'm going to call you right back. I'm like, there's a certain way that Jonathan and me answer the phone. I'm like, hello. So, I, and then we can continue, we can start our conversation. So, yeah, he, I say, hello. Hey man, I need you to do me a favor. I say, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Now wait a minute. He says, Oh, I'm sorry. So, all right, I need you to do something. I say, what? Can you record on my album? And I made this joke. I said, you know, I'm really expensive, bro. And this is a true story. He said, Well, man, I I got all these people, and I I say, I'm gonna tell you exactly what I want. And what did I charge you for the this is a true story? What did I charge you for the song? He charged me a uh, a Uber ride and a sandwich. Oh, <laughs> that's too expensive. It's it was too expensive actually. It's too expensive, and, and and the reason why I did that because let me tell you something. Jonathan is someone very close and dear to me because Jonathan is reminds me of like when I talk about my father. Jonathan is one of those type of people who I really admire and respect because. His compositions are amazing. And it puts me in the same mindset as like, reminds me of my dad, the way he thinks. Man. Cause out the box. So he's one of, there's six composers that I am in awe of cause they work. Jonathan's one of them. Yeah, likewise. You know, and now the song he says, he said, I sent him the song and I did all this. He says, bro, I want you to do six of your craziest solos. Just go. I said, man, you get three. Six, Weedy. I'm getting you a sandwich. <laughs> Fuck it. All right, six. So I did it. He says, I'm going to let you hear it in, in another week or two. Three weeks go by. He says, here, listen to this song. And he says, I got two bass players on here. I say, two bass players? He says, yeah, it's Mono Neon and Victor Wu. I say, what? <laughs> so, yeah, and I got another person on here, too. I say, what? He said, one of your close friends. I say, who? Christian Scott. I say, oh, man. So it ended up being like something really interesting because it was like the idea of that song is a very unique song, man. The first time we were, I played that song was myself, um, With Jonathan, Spud and Neon. But Robert Spussy and Mono Neon. And that song whooped everybody's ass. Hmm. Man, I think it's an easy song, actually. I thought you played that shit about a thousand times. <laughs> the third hit was late, actually. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Only reason why I know it, because I, we was on tour together with Is Power, and I heard it every night. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. So, so, so Jonathan, when you asked... Uh, when you asked Weedy to to be on this album, like how how did you know him at that point? Had you already played together and worked together or something? Well, okay, we gotta go back. We gotta go back a little bit because the first thing that happened was, um, I I had heard of Weedy because of the Empower, and they had recorded this video thing in Asheville, at Echo Mountain, and so um, that's when I first heard of him, and literally the same day that I heard of him, um, he sent me a message from Australia. 
It's a true story. Yeah. So I was like, oh, cool. I, I learned about this new musician who's really awesome, blah, blah, blah. And then in my inbox, I have a message from Weedy. Yeah. And he well, basically was just like, Weedy. Weedy, how did that, how did that come about? Why, why did you think of sending a message? I saw him play this damn. Oh, bang, bang, oh, bang, oh, bang, oh. No, you saw me play a, uh, you saw me, I thought you said you saw me play uh the thing with the Bela Fleck concerto. That's what it was. You were by yourself. Yeah. That's what it was. And it scared me. I will never forget. It had to be about one o'clock in the morning my time. It scared the living daylight of me. I said, who the fuck? I told Nikki, I said, have y'all seen this guy? And he was all nice with the A. It's John Scale. He's, he's the best. I say, yeah, he's the best. He's not even from this fucking world. Who is this dude? They'll tell you, I was like dumbfounded by this man. I was dumbfounded. Like, oh my God. It's all just tricks. Had, it's all just tricks. I just. It's all just like magic tricks. But no look at it man. like this. And that's one thing about me. Once I see something that I'm in awe of, once again, I go back to my mama. And everything I, she said it. And I remember telling Jonathan this. I said, Jonathan, we're going to play together one day. This is true. But so John, you're going to have the all star band. Well, wait, 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 wait. Let's one second. Because that part is, it didn't happen just quite like that. So I used to always call Weedy to complain about my band and stuff I was like the stuff I was dealing with or like, man, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? So, you know, um, or mentorship. Yeah. Mentorship, you know? And, um, there was a point cause we became friends from, you know, when we opened for the end power, me and we became good friends. Okay. And every night he would be standing in the front of the stage watching us. And that was there really was cool. song in, Tell him the song I was in love with the one song. Oh, kiss from a rose. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> um well anyway so i would call weedy about stuff and you know i had this trio with um cody wright on bass and Chaz ray shank on drums and you know we kind of got to this peak of the career where i mean we just did a world tour we went to japan we went to europe went to costa rica all over the states and then right after that world tour with that lineup both of those guys had to go on and do other things hmm. so then it was just me and I remember I called Weedy freaking out, like, man, what, what am I going to do, man? What am I going to do? And he said, and I quote, he's like, here's what you do. You're going to put a band together with you, me, Robert Sputsy Wright on drums, and Mono Neon on the bass. Uh-huh. I Did said, man. Are you guys in, in, in Nashville? No, that was years later. Oh, okay. But that was that lineup. Uh-huh. So, so, like, he was like, you're going to get you, me, Robert Sputsy Wright, and... Mono Neon. I said, man, you're crazy. Cause at that time you gotta understand, like I knew those guys as famous people, just like names. Yeah. I was like, man, you're crazy. Like, I, I don't, I don't, how would that, that even be possible? Mm -hmm. Right. I said, man, you're crazy. So I just wrote it off because like I had run in the spot a couple of times, but that's about it. And I didn't, I just knew Mono Neon from YouTube. That's it. Yeah. So then one day, um, you know, time goes by and I get a message from Sput randomly apart from what Weedy was saying. So Spud sent me a message and, he was, and basically was saying, man, I saw you're playing with this bass player, Jay White. He's like, man, we should play sometime, man. Just hit me up. So when, when Spud first hit me up, I was like, oh man, that's flattering. This really famous drummer is hitting me up saying, let's play. There's no way he means it. I just kind of just blew it off, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, but I was, you know, I, I, I kept it in mind, but I didn't think anything of it. Then, I got, in, I was in New Orleans during Jazz Fest and Sput was doing this event um, at Blue Nile, is that what it's called? Blue Nile. Yeah. Um, so Sput was doing this event at Blue Nile and he invited me out. And um, I was actually supposed to leave town the next day, but I stayed extra to, to hang out with Sput. And I basically went to play one song at like one o'clock in the morning and then drove to North Carolina from then. But the important thing is I met Model Neon uh -huh. that night or a brief moment. And then, so I thought back to what Weedy was saying, saying you need to put this band together. And then it was kind of like this magical moment where like, I can't believe that Weedy just like hand fed me this lineup hmm. out of his brain. And so I put it together and we did a tour. Two of them. And, and Weedy, what, 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 how did that lineup come to mind? They were all my friends. Uh -huh. so, you, so you wanted to play with them and be around them. 
You know, I got a special relationship with all the motherfuckers individually. Jonathan has the most sense out of everybody. <laughs> okay. Mono is brilliant. And Mono is Mono. Spud and me argue every five seconds. The sun is out. No, it's not. It's raining. Huh. But it's like that big brother, little brother. <clears throat> but on stage, musically, it was magical. We had some of the most magical moments mu musically during that tour. And also some of the craziest stuff, you know. You know, it's some funny stuff. I mean, it's, one day I could write a book of some of the most hilarious things. Poor Jonathan, because he would be in the car just like this, driving. That's like, <laughs> but musically, with the ideas Jonathan had, and with Spud, once again, Spud's another one of those in those top sixes as far as composers that I'm like, I'm in awe of. You know what I'm saying? It was really magical. And when all of us together, we came together and we put our minds to how we were, how we saw, how we felt Jonathan's music would already, it was already in the ethos, but this our own interpretation, how we felt his music from either being a fan or a listener or a watcher, it was a whole different experience. Yeah. Uh, so a few comments, uh, Leslie Judson, who's here in Nashville said, said yeah how beautiful regarding the, your song jonathan that we were listening to and she said as the storm rolls in uh, my backyard this is perfect music thank you both and also farnell newton who i think uh, i know oh yeah uh, farnell oh, he says dope lineup talking about that lineup farnell's in portland oregon where i used to live so i know farnell from there oh yeah uh, uh so good what's up farnell farnell newton is a legend man he's a great oh, yeah, he, when i heard him for the first time when he moved to portland i was like that's my favorite trumpet player. Barnell and me played together on numerous occasions. Uh -huh. Last one we did, we did was with um when the Earth Power did the I think the uh, Earth Wind and Fire tribute. That was uh -huh. a bad man. And thanks Farnell for not putting my name on the lineup list. You think I forgot about that? <laughs> <laughs> I got another random story about Weedy. Okay. This is random quick one, but um, so you know. As a band leader, and anybody who's a band leader knows that it's really hard, you know, dealing with personalities on top of logistics, on top of everything, right? And one day I was, um, I was really having a time with one of the musicians at the time. I'm not gonna name names, <laughs> not gonna name names, but I was having a really tough time with this one particular musician that was playing with me for a short period of time. And um, I was driving, I was driving in my van and I was just like angry and I was just mad, gripping the steering wheel. And uh, my phone was on silent, but I'd, I'd been like really mad for a while, right? Now I look over and my phone's lighting up and Weedy's calling me, right? I pick up the phone, I said, hello. And he said, it's gonna be okay. What? I was like, uh, well, he's like, it's gonna be okay. That, that was the conversation. How, how do you know? I don't know. I think he's, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't, I don't know. Weedy, how'd you know? Unforeseen forces. <laughs> I have unforeseen forces and unforeseen sources. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's a, about, that's a crazy, that's a crazy real. No, that, 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 you know what? The thing is when you're a musician, you gotta realize when you are tapped into spirit and you're tapped into the instrument, you're tapped into people. You know what to say. You don't know what to say. It knows what to say for you to say what it needs to be said to it need, who needs to hear it. This period. Period. Yeah. Oh, also, by the way, you guys forgot the person's name. It was Michael Weintraub. Michael Weintraub. Michael Weintraub. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm telling. That you all played out here. Don't tell him that. Oh, I'm telling. I just had a brain fart because he I was just thinking. Commented. He said, what? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know oh this is God. live. We, you know this is live. <laughs> I'm telling Michael Weintraub. Don't do that because I love his photos. His photos. Send, send him the know, video. No. Don't you do that. Uh, so Farnell says, love y'all dudes, miss y'all. And he said, ha ha, regarding the, the story. Um, so, so playing together in that group, tell me how that kind of how that evolved when you all started playing together the rehearsal was intense yeah we were we rehearsed for a couple of days in atlanta uh -huh. in somebody's basement in somebody's basement 
one of Spud's people's basement, and 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 and, <laughs> and we was all trying to get the music, but we all wanted to play it a certain way. <laughs> and Spud was watching the damn football game. Yeah, Spud was well, watching the football game. Like so, like I'll be explaining the part. Like, all right, so on this section, we're gonna go do this. This next, you know, yeah. And we're like, what? And we look over. What did I say? Like, Dallas is playing, and he's during the rehearsal. Spud was watching the <laughs> football game. Uh, and I say, turn that shit off, man. <laughs> Mr. You can tag him in this. I'm going to. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a clip of this and tag it. Tag him. <laughs> tag him. So but yeah, so I love working with Jonathan though. Jonathan is. This was a real good treat. Now, mind you, I literally just got off the phone with him no less than 45 minutes ago while I'm in the studio uh -huh. letting him hear stuff we're working on, and he's on here. He yeah. is a you didn't know. And also, I talked to you yesterday, too. Yes, I did. Surprise. So you guys Surprise. had intense, intense uh, you were rehearsing, it was intense. And and then where did you, where did, where was the tour and, and how did that develop? It was like, a, it was a seven, eight tour. Uh -huh. Sure it was. And uh, like, it was, it was crazy. It was like, honestly, I could probably say to this day, it was probably my most intense seven day tour. Uh -huh. hmm. There was a lot of there was a lot of hype around it too, just because like people were kind of blown away that it was the four of us in particular. And um yeah, every night was crazy. Like Monday through Sunday. It was on top of that, we had um the funky knuckles open it up before. And the funky knuckles opened up the whole show. So it was yeah. But there I don't remember I don't remember much of the rehearsals, honestly. Like you asked about I, I knew they were intense, but I don't remember. All I remember was the only thing I remember is I remember picking up Model Neon from the airport. And, um, you know, I texted him trying to organize everything. And when you don't know him that well, he's not much of a talker. Uh -huh. When you get to know him, that's a different story, but he's not much of a talker at first. And uh, so I sent him the plane ticket, told him what time I pick him up. No response. So I was like, I'm just going to show up and see what happens. So I showed to the airport in Atlanta and I didn't know what to expect. And Model Neon was Model Neon. It was like, he wasn't dressed any differently, uh -huh. you know, because this is back in the day, right? Or not that far back in the day, this is like 2016 or something like that. Uh -huh. 2016, yes, yes. So I was, so that was like, that was shocking to me. That was my first like real experience with Mono Neon uh -huh. because before that I had only met him for about, I met him for like two minutes and took a selfie with him in New Orleans at one in the morning. Uh -huh. that, and then the second time I saw him, I was picking him up from the airport so like I was I was actually surprised to see as a fan to pick him up and he's model neon. It wasn't it wasn't an act. It wasn't like a character. It was him, hundred yeah. percent. For for anyone and guess who's his roommate? Who was that? You were oh, you're his roommate. So for no. anyone who's familiar with Mono Neon, he's he he is branded very well. And but but I, I don't know him, but he he seems he seems genuine and he is music man. That uh -huh. man is music. It, no if and a buts. I knew he, he he did something to this day. I tell people the story. I realized he knows what's up. I was once again on the road in Atlanta, got home late, got me something to eat. And I woke up and I woke up. We had to get ready. We had a lobby call at like seven in the morning, go to the next city. And I looked to my right. He's in the bed, he's laying with his face. And it was that that moment I knew he knows what music is. Cause my teacher used to always tell me, and I did this for years, sleep with my djembe hmm. for years, you know, I'll tell you that there's a picture of me with that. But when I saw him do that, I said, he knows, hmm. he knows he's yeah. connected. Well I know Jonathan, you said you have to get going. I might have a I have a couple more minutes. Okay, awesome. If, do uh, Do you have any questions about, you know, anything? I got a question. Yeah, what, yeah. what did he say when he went to to help them? <laughs> Can you? Oh, speaking of which, so, okay, you know what? I know it's an inside joke. Let's not talk about that. It's inappropriate. But I I will say so. Weedy has an album that's going to be coming out at some point. Uh huh. And you know the you know the real question is so he asked me to help him arrange some things and to write a couple of things so I'm very proud of that but you know what he didn't he did not ask me to play on his record 
I didn't tell anyone that. I've never confronted him about that, but I just want to let it know publicly right now. So it sounds like I'm, I'm offended. Would like to let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you the story. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I'm gonna tell it. <laughs> so there one of the songs on that I needed help with, right? The song was done. Mm-hmm. And all the voice memos of everything. What this man did was so creepy. I never take somebody that, to, I mean, even with all my stuff, I always keep my voice, voice memos of everything. Yeah, when he this says the song is done, he, what he means, let me just do translation. By the song is done, what he means is he sent me a voice memo of just him singing to nothing. Just uh-huh. just, just randomly, like if, if you play it, it sounds like just this crazy person just saying stuff. Uh-huh. Just the melody, yeah, but, the, rhythms. Yeah. Again, no, not rhythms. No, not rhythms. No <laughs> rhythm. This was just the the melody of the idea I had. Right. This one in particular song. I said, "Here, man, I got this. Can you please just help me out with this?" He says, "Arrange it and yeah, yeah, that's it." He says, "Okay." Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I say it's missing something. Can you put a little put put, put can you put a little something? It's something missing. No way. What's are you telling the, are you telling the story about the first song we did? No, 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 no. Man, about the second. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Stop yourself yeah. right now. Yeah, yes, this, this is definitely. I say, can you, can you put some more weedy in it? Some more weedy. You want me to put more weedy? The song is actually done, weedy. You already did. I said this this line, but he helped me with this line that was so incredible. I still don't know. It, it was so incredible when 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 people hear, they're gonna be like, "Whoa!" Mm-hmm. It's such a trip. I can't wait till the album comes out. But um, the first the first thing that I did for him was he sent me a voice memo that had a stuff, and he was like, "Hey, man." He make a um he just arrange this and kind of put it together. And so, you know, I'm kind of this, I'm still looking up to him as a, you know, my hero. Yeah. So I took this opportunity to say, all right, I'm gonna just bust my ass and work on this real hard. So I think I had it to you like in less than 24 hours. It was. And like, and also I put together a demo for him so that he can like hear all the horn parts, everything. You do like MIDI so he, or did you play it all all on the the um, on MIDI? On MIDI. Yeah, I played I played everything on MIDI. Uh-huh. Um and also also MIDI and also like some random hand percussion. Like I would take a a bowl or now like a Tupperware. And that, that was just trash. You, you did but that, you know, <laughs> but the idea was good. <laughs> yeah, so and there's some and there's some ideas that I played on Tupperware that That's he does the, now in the original, I, kept that. I know, that's what I'm saying. So don't talk trash about my <laughs> Homemade percussion. Actually, because... actually and honestly, you remember you says, Weedy, I feel good. Could you just give me my my uh, <laughs> give me my uh my point for putting give me that drum piece? Because that's my drum breakdown. I'm proud of that. Give yeah, this. I wrote there's a there's a drum breakdown on Weedy Brahma's new album when it comes out that I it was my idea. Nice. Let let it be let the record show. Cause I always I always make fun of Weedy. I was like, I know you're not gonna give me credit. I know. I told- and what, when's it coming out, Weedy? I'm not supposed to say. I'm not supposed to be talking about it. Okay, okay. Well, I know I brought it up. So, but so just so now it's clear though the next the next one whatever it sounds like Jonathan would like to would like to play on it too. I'm just messing with him. I'm just messing with him. Uh, actually, I'm actually, actually to be honest with you, I actually played the song live with us one time. Yeah, this is true. Um, yeah. but to be honest with you, like. There's some, there's, I know Weedy's not supposed to talk about his album, but like, I'm one of the rare people in the world who have heard the album mm-hmm. and I'm not even on it except for some arranging, I r- helped arrange some things, but it's going to be incredible. And when it hits the world, it's going to be, it's, it's some next level stuff. Cool. Like I've heard some like rough mixes and stuff and it's crazy. So like, I'm honored just to be on it, arranging a couple ideas here and there, but the players that are on it, which I'm not going to name names. Uh, but it's like the, the best of the best of the best yeah, are yeah, on it. Sure. Uh, I, you know, the funny thing is, the things too, for me, is that, and this is what me and um, it, um, 
what well, one guy that's you know one of my good friends christian scott is on that but but the thing is one thing that's i, I wanted people don't look at me as a this you know a lot of people say oh he's a djembe player this album you're gonna see where my composition side comes from you're gonna really see where i come from from that from that world that's why i'm in you know i'm really i was talking about my father and really in like in using all in golf and all that that i looked up to him and like i said six people as far as the ranges that i really think that are like brilliant one of them like i said is the man i'm talking to right here you know so yeah, well, one other thing I, I was going to say before I go, I'm sorry to cut you off, Cliff, no, okay. but one thing about Weedy, what Weedy is saying about how he is, um, he wants people to know that he's more than just a Jimmy player and he has all these great ideas. It's crazy because I'm, I know how great a musician Weedy is, but we know when he sent me these voicemails of him just like, you know, singing into the phone, at first I was like, man, this sounds crazy. This sounds crazy, but I told him I'm going to do it. So then I start tracking it out. I start scoring it all out. Like transcribing note for note and i'm like and the whole time i'm like this is crazy and then when i get to the end of it i'm like oh my god i can't believe that was in your head so it's, you you were able to kind of make sense of it more after doing all that yeah after putting it on the paper there, i think with with the, the voice memo was me doing the song uh -huh. and he literally wrote it out and he told me he says that's not gonna work i said it's gonna work and by the end he says i never forget i was in la he said weedy I don't know how you made the you the transition was the same. It was the same. I said, I told you. Yeah, it was crazy. Just like certain things that just sounded like randomness. And then like when you loop it, it's like, oh, how did phrasing wise, how did how are you thinking of this? So like I was blown away just like transcribing his voice memos. Yeah. So yeah. One day, one day, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leak those, weedy. You know I'm, what? I'm, I would like that. I'm gonna leak your that? embarrassing voice memos. I, I have the same. I have the same stuff. I have an embarrassing voice memos of me singing my songs, which are really horrible because I'm a really bad singer. I'm well, a bad. Yeah, uh, Weedy earlier. I don't know if you heard it, but he was singing the theme song. Uh, what was it? One of the theme songs, and you you can tell the way he sings. Oh, you're talking about National Geographic, but yeah. did it, but, but, oh yeah, it was like that. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Thanks for, for jumping in and joining us, Jonathan. Uh, yes. Also, thank you for playing on the Cliff Chats theme song. I'm, uh, Rock Along Bob Moses um, is recording on it, so there should be, it'll be an interesting mix of people. Rock Along is on like Bright Size Life and a lot of great albums wow. uh, playing with Jocko and Pat Metheny. Um, so that's that's going to be interesting. I'm excited. And uh, uh, so, yeah, thank you for, for, for saying hi and um, sharing some stories. Yes, thanks for having me. And good to surprise you, Weedy. And uh, I will talk to you later. I'm sure you're going to be calling me. Yeah, I'm talking shit. <laughs> and Weedy, oh, I want to thank you. Um, there, there's, there was a lot. There were a lot of questions that I had that we didn't get to. So I hope we can have another conversation sometime. Yeah, we definitely can, man. That's not, that's a given. Yeah. Well, and and also, if you're ever in Nashville, um, you know, I'd love to host you um, as a guest teacher or do do something here you know that's my you know nashville is another one of my like one of my stomping grounds i got a lot of you know on the african drum and dance community shout out to all, all the great jimmy fola the obayanas the marias Maria uh, oh, yeah. uh, shannon yeah i don't know if she's still down there playing jimmy i you know i've been here for five years and i've never met shannon hey shannon he play i've heard he's a great player i've never met him Shannon, he played. I was mad at Shannon for a long time, but Shannon's a great gym before. Great. Yeah. One of my good friends. Yeah, Maria, Maria's awesome. I, I see her every now Oh, Maria's show. that's my that's my let me tell you something. Maria, I remember the first time I saw her play. Mm -hmm. 1996 uh -huh. in St. Louis at Coca. Uh-huh. I will never forget it. She'll tell you the story. It's this old taboo of people saying women not supposed to drum. In the dance class, and some some woman said she ain't supposed to play. She's a woman. Ain't Jimmy supposed to play? And she remember she ran out the class crying, mm. and she didn't know it was me. She wanted to meet me. She didn't know it was me. So I, I went to her. I said, "What's wrong?" She said, I, said, I can't play. I said, "Who? You want to play? Yeah, but then I... come on, let's go." Uh -huh. So we went in there and started playing, and she started drumming, and she said, "Man, thank you. High five me. Thank you. We playing." And I got the plan, and she looking like, oh shit. And I'm like, go ahead. She had a remote Jimmy. <laughs> and in a class, 
I said, man, you play amazing. She said, you do. What's your name? I said, my name's Weedy. And she said, oh my God. A mutual friend of mine named Shaka who lives in New Orleans was like, y'all need to play with each other. Y'all need to play in me. And that was it. That's been my little sister and a phenomenal, 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 phenomenal musician. So big ups to her. She's yeah, a phenomenal Jimmy Fuller. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last time I saw her and played with her, I, I brought Bullock out of town and we performed. And she oh, was- Bullock was there. What's that? Mm-hmm. Bullo was there. Yeah, yeah. And and she was trading solos with him and um holding her own and it was it was cool. Um well thank you so much, Weedy. Uh I really appreciate you taking the time and thank you everybody for tuning in. Mm-hmm.